So, how's everyone? Let's let's begin with uh, our traditional meditation. Later, I think maybe we'll begin to do some prayers. It's very traditional, you know. Every lecture you go to with Tibetan lamas, there are always many prayers to recite, right? So I find uh, it's good. To, obviously, it's important to recite the prayers, but also it's good to try to have an understanding of what those prayers are meant to do, to calm the mind and to set a good motivation. So that's why we're, these days, we're finding some time to meditate at the beginning. So I hope you don't feel offended that we're not doing prayers. Do you feel upset when we're doing this? I'd like to be doing prayers. Okay. I guess I'm just used to it. Yeah, okay, we can do some prayers for Diana <laughs> next time. Okay. <laughs> we can start doing some prayers. Okay, so try to relax your mind, <coughs> relax your body. <coughs> mm. Bring your attention first to the easily findable breathing and see if you can withdraw your attention away from both the senses and the, all the preoccupying thoughts. Then slowly withdraw your attention even further inward to your mental consciousness as though it were centered at your heart chakra, although it pervades other places. Here away, away from the cerebral region that's more conceptualizing, more prone to be overcome with discursive thoughts. Remind yourself it's not the eye consciousness, nor the ear consciousness, your nose, taste, or even the tactile that pervades the body.
and not having merely a state of no thoughts, but actively perceiving the nature of the mind as being clear light, unobstructing, unobstructed, within which the various thoughts can arise. space within which all of the cloud-like thoughts pass. Then with the body as though transparent, not grasping on to the sensation, the tactile sensation of its presence. Even letting go of the sense of the eye, a separate observer. Just try to abide for some time in the pure state of consciousness, just mind knowing its own nature. Whatever arises doesn't become an obstacle to that apprehension, but reaffirms it. If there are any thoughts, objective thoughts to be distracted to, objects of thought, or subje subjective responses, they're all possible because of that clarity of the mind. They're all known, experienced due to the faculty of knowing that we have no solution to our own suffering, our own condition in cyclic existence by ourself. Even if we've learned something of the path, have a certain direction, still helpless, blown by the winds of karma, under the influence of the various wild beasts of our mind. Think, I'm going to take refuge to the Buddha, the enlightened one, the Dharma that he taught, and all the Buddhas that come at all three times, the past, the present, and the future, all teach variations of 
the liberating dharma. And the sangha, the supreme bodhisattva sangha here as we're listening to the Mahayana teachings, those Arya bodhisattvas whose realization of emptiness is conjoined with realization of conventional bodhicitta, I'm going to take refuge in the triple gem until I'm enlightened. And not simply developing a, a sense of Mahayana motivation, Mahayana refuge, but the thought of Buddha as much as we have practiced it in the past, I think due to the merits that I'm going to create now through listening to the teachings, may this become the cause of my achieving enlightenment, Buddhahood, from which state I can benefit all living beings. And as we dedicate at the, at the end of the teachings, within the three spheres, also the action, any action that we motivate with, any action that we do, the Bodhisattvas try to practice within the perfection of wisdom, seeing the agent, in this case ourself, let's say, listening to the teachings, the action, the action of listening, teachings themselves that we're listening to, all empty of inherent existence. Whatever we understand of that as we progress along, there is an action of listening, but it can't be found anywhere. There is a conventional self, but it can't be found more than pointing conventionally to our body and mind complex and saying that person is listening, can find an inherently existent person within this aggregates. And even the Dharma itself, the teachings in this case, Lurik, although seemingly concrete and embodying some findable knowledge, findable matter, findable subject. We can't find it anywhere either. It's just a name that we impute. that we're using the, you know, the, 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 the functions and the 
they had those these are all um, <clears throat> we're talking mainly from the point of view of the South Trantica tenant. So, do you know how you, you know how you spell that? South Trantica. S A U T R. South Trantica, right? T R A, right? So sometimes you might get that mixed up with uh, one of the higher schools called Sva Tantrika. Sva Tantra. So here it's it's the, this one the school is the higher of the two Hinayana schools that we study the tenets of traditionally in, in Tibetan Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism. Related with, um, I think one of the etymologies is uh, related with their uh, understanding of the Abhidharma. We talked about this before, right? So they're, they say that the Abhidharma can be found in the sutras. So they're called Sautrantika, Sutra, T-R-A in Sutra, right? So Saut, Sautrantikas. And so <clears throat> for the most part, that's how these, uh, this presentation is being given, although there's some things that are common uh, with the Vaibhashikas, and there's some things that are common, a lot of, a lot of it's common with all of the, the Mahayana schools too, but we'll see some things that are different. Uh, like here, for instance, when it talked about, uh, did I have to turn this on? Yes. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I thought you were not sure you were motioning to you're just you just had an itchy throat. Okay. Um, like for instance we talked about prime cognizers. And uh, I wasn't able to get for Marina a, a whiteboard for this session, but she was she was asking uh, you know, to try to put up somewhere so she could see visually and it could be more clear the different translations of the same word. Pramana is a t is Sanskrit word, right? Tibetan, you know what it is in Tibetan? You know that? You say? Probably once I hear it, I'll say Tsema. 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 There's a famous text called Tsema Namdel. Namdel means like a complete explanation of, of Pramana, Pramana Vartika. So Pramana, Tsema, those are two different words. Some people translate it as valid cognizer. Some translate it as prime cognizer. How is it being translated here in this in this text? We're just talking about this now, right? Pardon? A new prime cognizer? Prime cognizer, right? Prime. So that's that's kind of trying to take the you know, different ways that you might take prime. If um, kind of valid is a more general way of saying prime. I'm not sure what prime might mean to, to the people who've uh, used it as translation. Sometimes it might mean kind of like the, the, the main one, whereas um, the main qualification of a pramana, of a, of a valid cognition from the highest tenets, the present Gika tenets, is that it realize its object. It doesn't have to do it newly, freshly, as the Sotrantikas take here, and as some of the other schools take. Okay. Anyone else have a question? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I may have just gotten okay. really off on this one, but I had looked over some notes and I had made a note about perception. This is great. You've got cards and everything, well, right? Yeah. This I can't read my writing if I don't read it. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> it was about referent objects, and I had written down that a referent object is the same as the perceived object. So In some know. cases, some cases it is. It, it is. Like for instance, if I if I, the referent object, you could also translate it as observed object. We say, in Tibetan, we say mikyul. Uh, so the, the referent object here is the flower, 
and the perceived hour, uh, object is the flower, let's say. But the, one of the examples I gave, for instance, if I was observing, what, what's your name again? Mark. Mark. If I was observing Mark, if, he w if Mark was the, let's say, conventional Mark, conventionally existent Mark was the observed object of my investigation, if I'm thinking about that, thinking about Mark, that's the, obser that's the observed or referent object. But I may be perceiving that conventionally existent person as truly existent, as, let's say, in a grosser sense, having a self-supporting, substantially existent person that's there. So the referent object would be the thing that I'm referring to, that I'm observing. But what I'm conceiving of, the conceived object, would be a truly existent mark. The, and the object that's being perceived it would be a truly existent mark. Does such a thing exist? No. So there's some cases when you're <laughs> surprised. There's some cases <laughs> sorry Mark. Darn. Uh, there's some cases when um what did I say? I can't remember how I was going to say that. So the you know, we, we, we observe one thing, but we conceive of it in a different way. Okay? Also, you can take, a, if you have the flower uh, as the referent object, you may be centering in on one of its attributes, like its shape or its color, with your visual consciousness. Um, like the blue, you may be, um, the perceived object may be the blue color that may be the apprehended object. So the, the referent object doesn't always have to be the apprehended object, but it can be. If you're just apprehending flower, if the, if the referent object is a flower and you're apprehending flower, then they would be the same, the referent object. But see, the, the, the utility of referent object comes, I think, one of the interesting things is comes is when we talk about Conception, when the referent, when you refer to something, you're observing something with your mind, but you're conceiving of it, you're conceiving it in a way that might be contradictory to that. Okay? That might be different, like, like conceiving it as truly existent. Like Mark, I conceive of him as, I have this idea of skin and hair and eyes and form and mm -hmm. tall and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I have all these. It's a form. He's a form to me. Yeah, sometimes we may conceive of a person as a form, but it's said that uh, the, especially according to higher tenets, the person is the being imputed on the five aggregates. So the the person is not itself the con what you're observing actually is the conventionally existent mark. But you may not even recognize that. That's what you're observing. That's what you're thinking about, let's say, in a sense. That's what you're the that's what motivated you to, you know, to think in some way. That's your referent object. It may not be something you're mo you, you may not even have an idea of what conventionally existent mark is. You know, a little baby or a cow or you know an ordinary person on the train doesn't think in terms of conventionally existent persons and truly existent persons. They don't see a differentiation. But that is indeed what you're referring to, the conventionally existent person. Because that's the only thing that does exist, conventionally, in terms of, of the person. You might be just observing the form, indeed, but if you're thinking of the, 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 the form as being a person, you might, you might sometimes project impute person onto the form aggregate. Like say, for instance, in our own meditation, when we think about our own self-identity, sometimes we identify, we have a sense of I that seems to be identical to the form aggregate. So as though, as though I 
were the, uh, the form aggregate, or maybe one might say imputed on the form aggregate. But that's not, that's not the actual conventionally existent I. Conventionally existent I is one that is suitable to be imputed on all five of the aggregates, you know, that, and then on that whole complex. So that's, that may be what you're observing. That's, what's, that's what you're actually, say, referring to. If we use another word for this mick. Mick can mean, mikba can mean kind of referring or observing. And you may be conceiving of it in a certain way. You may be conceiving of that person as being the form, or, or as you said, the skin or the, the hair or, you know, whatever. Khaki, what is it called? The kind of shirt. Kind of blue. I used to wear. I used to wear it's blue. I'm sorry, blue shirt. That's what it's it called. Blue shirt. I thought it was called something else. I saw on the cover of the. Did you see the New York Times magazine this last weekend with the picture from the the Day of Miracles here? There was one nun that was prostrating over there. I think there might have been Sophia. And uh, on the cover, it had a fellow looked a little bit bored. Did you see this one? And he it it had a little gap label on his shirt, and it said. This man used to make three hundred thousand dollars a year. Now he's selling khaki. I think it said something like that. You know, like so I was trying to think of some kind of name of the, the name. Khaki. Is that nice? No, not a khaki shirt. No, I can't remember. Denim, maybe. I can't remember. We used to call it something in blue shirts in college. So the referent object is sometimes the object that's being observed is being perceived. Sometimes it's not actually being perceived. We're interfering with that actual perception by conceiving it, conceiving of the referent object as something else, either as truly existent or as the form aggregate or something like that. So it's very hard for us to make that distinction. Yeah, that might be a good, that might be a good object of investigation in this coming week to see uh, how off, you know, how much our projections, like what, what you're actually observing, how much of it is, is clouded over, is, is uh, obscured from an actual perception to you by the, the mind, the intellect, projecting upon it and thinking of it a certain way, thinking of it something else, like friend or enemy. You know, sometimes um, Conventionally speaking, there might be some things that we can label friend and enemy, but our mind conceives of them as truly existent also. It might be, and sometimes we're not even, many, many times we're not even correct conventionally, you know, what we think of the thing as. So it could be, it would be worth investigating this, this coming week to see if you can go a little deeper into that. Let's see, anyone else have? We'll, we'll, See if there's any other. You have a question. Yeah. Oh, good. You back on page 16. Oh, good. Of 17. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, there's two terms that I'm not familiar with: uh, continuum of samkhya, mm -hmm. and, um, and then the continuum of vaishishi. Mm -hmm. I think a samkhya is a kind of Arabic sandwich, isn't it? That one that they. No, no, that's that's that's, that's different. Uh, oh, we talked about this last time. Samkhya, this is on the bottom of page 16. We're talking about the, uh, the uh, inattentive self-knower, right? Self-knowing direct perceivers. And one of the divisions would be self-knowers which are inattentive. That is to say, something appears to them, but it's not ascertained. So. The Buddhists give these examples here. The Satrantikas give these examples. Like, say, for instance, in the, in the continuum of one particular Indian, uh, the, the practitioners of one Indian school, the Samkhyas, they believe, uh, they're called that because they, make, they enumerate the various uh, phenomena into various, I think, 25 categories or something like that. So one of their tenets is that um, bliss, or let's say uh, pleasure, is not a consciousness. It's something else. 
But in fact, from Buddhist perspective, it is. Let's say, from Buddhist perspective, in reality, it is consciousness. The experience of happiness or, or bliss is actual experience of, that, that feeling is consciousness. It's not, it's not as though, when we go through the five aggregates, one of the aggregates is called consciousness aggregate, right? Does that mean feeling is not an aggregate, is not a consciousness? No, they're all consciousness. The, the consciousness aggregate is primary consciousness, right? These other three aggregates, feeling, discrimination, and compositional factors, these are all uh, consciousness also, but they're secondary mental factors, secondary consciousness, secondary mental factors. So to a Samkhya, uh, if they're still holding, they say, oh, no, no, this is not consciousness. The implication is they have a self-knower that's within their continuum that's realizing that bliss is a consciousness, because it, there is, every consciousness has, according to the Swachantika and the other schools that accept that, all of them have, every consciousness has a self-knower, every consciousness other than a self-knower itself, has a self-knower which is knowing its entity. Did you follow that what I said there, every consciousness other than a self-knower is itself, every, every other knowing consciousness that is, every consciousness that is knowing something other than itself has a self-knower as part of its entity, which is just aware, not of the object that it's knowing, but just of its state. So that blissful consciousness, must, there must be a self-knower that's, that's knowing that. So if that is, if that self-knower uh, for the Samkhya doesn't, uh, how to say, if they don't pay attention to that, in other words, that's kind of the implication, is, is that's inattentive, it must be inattentive in, the, in their consciousness because they're, they're adamant that the, the happiness is not consciousness. Does that make any sense? Help a little? What do you think, Thea? Does that make no sense at all? It makes sense to me. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. So, if someone else have a question they wanted to catch up on? I actually have another question. Okay, yep, yeah, sure. It's totally lost me. Oh, okay. Well, oh, and so the similar thing for the Vaisheshika, so, yeah. the, okay. Vaisheshika is another, uh, uh, what do you call the, uh, you could call it Hindu, more Vedic schools, one of the Vedic schools. Tibetans, we, in Tibetan, we say Chetakpa. And the nihilist is actually the Charvakas. The, the second line on page 17, what they translate here as nihilist, is actually the actual, it could, should it be translated as charvaka, that's exactly what it's usually called in, in uh, Indian language and Sanskrit. So they don't accept inferential cognizers as being prime cognizers. That's so, the, the implication being there again, they don't accept that, and because they're, they're so adamant and, and you know, so, so dumb about it, supposedly, that must be that their self-knowing consciousness is not, is, is not paying attention to that, is unaware of that, doesn't ascertain that. Okay, so what's your other question? Yeah. Um, page 20. Mm -hmm. oh, did we get that far? Okay, we'll get there today. Okay, yeah. Your, your brain could not gronk on that? Grok it. Grok it. Okay. Could you, trans could you define grok for me? It's a conceptualization. Conceptualization, yeah. I, I, I visualize enough being able to wrap around it. To grok it. Okay. Thanks. That's good. I have to learn these things. So. <laughs> An illustration of the second. Is that the mm -hmm. paragraph? An inferential cognizer through renown. So we'll talk about this today is an inferential cognizer which realizes that it is suitable to express the rabbit possessor by the term moon from the sign of its existing among objects of thought. That does sound, without some explanation, that does sound a bit <laughs> obscure, right? So, what do we, we have different names. Anything could be called anything. 
Like, for instance, you called conceptualization when you get around something grokking. Perfectly legit. You could call it grokking. Is that is some, you know, scholar from, you know, uh, Den Haag or something like that, you know, or, or Belgian scholar. What would you say? Mar is it Marika? Yeah, some, you know, very... No, you must say this word. You don't have to. I mean, it's only by convention that we name things. So there are many names, especially in poetry, for the moon in Sanskrit. One of them is, could be translated into English. I, I don't know the Sanskrit term offhand, but the Tibetan, we say ribon, ribon, what is it, what is it? Ribon Chen, ribon Chen, I guess. Having, possessing the rabbit. Why is that? Because at a certain latitudes, uh, in the, when the moon rises, it looks like there's a rabbit in it. Do you ever see the rabbit in the moon? What? You never saw the rabbit in the moon? You saw the rabbit in the moon. What else do we, do, what do we say in the West? Do we have the man in the moon? Okay, we say the man in the moon, but we don't, there may be some poetic terms in our English language too, if you think about it, for the moon. What, what do we say? Or in, a, in some other language, in Italian, what else do they say besides Luna or something? Do they have some other name for the moon? It's not so important to us. Maybe now, maybe in earlier times, when it was more prominent in our lives, you know, in the times of shepherds and stuff, there were probably poetic names for it because there were different attributes that people noticed. So when it says the rabbit possessor, that's just referring to one of the poetic names of the moon. So it says here, an illustration of an inferential cognizer through renown is an inferential cognizer which realizes. So this is, means some kind of logical, a mind which has realized the fact that it is suitable to express the moon by the name rabbit possessor, or as it puts it here, to express the rabbit possessor, in other words, the moon, putting it, by the term moon, from the sign, due to the sign, because the, the, uh, an inferential cognizer ha is depending on some logical statement. It is suitable to do that. What's the sign? Because it exists among objects of thought. So why is that a suitable thought? Anything that exists about, among objects of... Sorry? What is it? Because of its existing, is the it referring to rabbit possessor? Or it, uh, or an inferential cognizer which realizes that it is suitable to express the rabbit possessor by the term moon from the sign that it exists. Well, that means the moon, the, mo the rabbit possessor, exists among objects of thought. That object that we can give both names to. Because you, know, you can call it, you can call it grokking, right? We, we, we learned that earlier. I just learned that, yeah. It's suitable to call that grokking. Okay. Now, Thea, you had a question. You were... Well, didn't you say I that did. What is that, sir? Well, That's just another name for the moon, the rabbit possessor. But based it's, on the fact that the rabbit is in the moon, is a part of it. Yes, Tom. The moon is blue cheese. <laughs> no, there's no rabbit in the moon. It's just. Well, it looks like. <laughs> okay, I don't want. I don't want to. I'm just joking here. I know you don't believe that. I was just teasing. But what what is called the possessor of the rabbit that's just a name people poetically say ah the possessor of the rabbit you can call it that you can call the moon that that big orb in the sky or you can call it the hunk of blue cheese in the sky you can call it anything you want because it exists among objects of thought anything that exists among objects of thought in other words anything that exists can be an object of thought can be called anything there's no names that inherently adhere to things. That's kind of the reasoning that one would use to, for that inferential cognizer. Maybe some of the confusion is because we had that term, object possessor. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Rabbit possessor, Rabbit possessor yeah. <laughs> right? It's still the word, yeah, it's ribon chen, and we had yul chen before, possessing an object, right? <laughs> So you could say that which has a rabbit, maybe that would be rather than a possessor, because it kind of 
the thing that has a rabbit, the place where there's a rabbit. Thea, you had a question? Consciousness has a self-knower, except the self-knower itself. Yeah. Um, so, my question is, is a self-knower able to recognize itself as a self-knower? Or is it so absorbed in that state of self-knowing that it is t <laughs> totally aware beyond labeling something as observed or... Or what it uh, let's say let's say what an, an other knowing consciousness most of what we think of as consciousness is called to be uh, shenric other knowing knowing something which is other than itself so let's say I consciousness knows shapes and colors doesn't I consciousness itself the other knower I consciousness doesn't know itself it doesn't know that it is knowing it just knows shape and color um, according to these tenets, that consciousness has another element to it. Part of its nature is its ability, that consciousness also has the ability to look inward, to, not you know, like this, but to know that it is knowing. They say that otherwise you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be able to recall that you actually saw the blue or whatever. So that self-knower if you were to have, if it were to be, how to say, uh, verified, or if it was necessary for it to to prove that there was such a thing that it had a self knower knowing it, then you would have a, an infinite regress. There would have to be an inf there would have to be a self knower knowing that self knower, and there would have to be one knowing that, and so forth. So here it's just said that every other knowing consciousness has a self-knower, and the self-knower itself uh, verifies the, the knowing of the outer object. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if that's any clearer. So is the self-knower the consciousness? Self-knower is uh, kind of like... In their view, in this view, is because like the present Gika, the, uh, I, I think we mentioned this before, and it, it comes in many times in the in the uh, Buddhist Vatara Vatara and the Majjhimaka Vatara. The present Gika does not accept that self knower is necessary; that it, there is such a thing as a self knower. Remember the example Shanti Deva said: just as a sword cannot cut itself, consciousness cannot know itself. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? You, maybe I've mentioned that before in class. So either, although you can, like I said, you can turn the blade, maybe you can bend the blade so one part of the blade cuts another, but one part of the blade can't cut itself, no matter how you try to move it around, you know, thinking I'm going to cut the blade with itself because it's there and it's the blade, it doesn't work. So he, they, they give that example, or like Shantideva says, an, a lamp cannot illuminate itself. A lamp illuminates something else. It doesn't illuminate itself. And uh, they say that there is not... One of the reasons that these tenets say there has to be a self-knower is for, the, the, uh, for memory to take place, for there to be a mem remembering consciousness, that you, knew, that you experience something. The upper tenets would say that merely the other knower, just the consciousness itself, knowing that other object is capable of inducing certainty later that you experienced it, that you knew it. So they, they say, no, you don't need a self-knower. But according to the Satrantikas, as Mark was asking, is this Satrantika tenets, according to Satrantika and the Chittamatra and some of the, even some of the Majamaka schools, there is such a thing as self-knower. So it's quite renowned in in Buddhism. So it's sort of, we're getting kind of familiar with that terminology here. So let's go on a little bit further. Okay. So I'm not sure. Did we, I think we got on page 17 to yogic direct receivers or did we get beyond that? No. Just, just, just about where we had gotten, right? The definition of a yogic direct perceiver. So the reason we have these, remember there are four kinds of direct perceivers? Do you remember, Don? What are they? 
You don't remember. Okay, you weren't here last time, so you get a pass. You get a pass. Bonnie was here though. Sense, sense, mental. sense mental. The one we were just talking about. Self -knowing, self knowing direct perceivers, right? Okay. So sense direct perceivers are the ones we're most conscious of. Mental direct perceivers, we don't have many examples of in our continuum, but it includes things like clairvoyance and so forth. Actually, yogic and, according to some people, like in, in Lati Rupeshe's book, he said, you might say that yogic and self-knowing direct perceivers are, have to be categorized as mental direct perceivers because they don't have another uh, kind of exclusive faculty other than the mind itself. The sense, the sense direct perceivers have a sense faculty, physical, physical based faculty. Mental direct perceivers have just the, the mental sense power, which is a previous instant of consciousness that can give rise to that, right? So yogic direct, uh, sense, uh, what do you call it? Self-knowing direct perceivers, we just talked about a little bit now. We talked about that before. Now yogic direct perceivers, it says that which is generated independence on its own uncommon empowering condition. That means like the faculty of it, its exclusive faculty, that which only it has, <clears throat> is a meditative stabilization. So that is a consciousness, isn't it? Meditative stabilization is what word, do you remember? In Sanskrit? Is it this word samadhi? That's how they're translating here, meditative stabilization. So it's it, it is a samadhi, which is a union of shamatha and vipassana. So a meditative stabilization, which is a union of calm abiding, that's called shamatha. Tibetans we call shine, and special insight. So the example, I think I mentioned before, example sometimes given in the sutras, shamatha is kind of like... Um, the turbid mind in which, which is constantly agitated, from which the mud of our delusions is sort of all around, has been calmed, so there's no longer agitation. Like, like the, the example, the poetic example, is like a, like a little pond in the mountains that the king's horse's army has just run through. So that little pool of water, once they've run through it, all the horses or hooves, they bring up the mud and the water is sort of, what do you call it, you know, turbulent and everything. So when, that allow, when that's allowed to calm down, in other words, when you don't have a lot of thoughts running through your mind, the mind can calm down, the turbulence, and the mud can begin to sink. And you can be left with a lucid, like a lucid pool of water in the, in the beautiful mountains. So that's like likened to shamatha calming the mind from the usual discursive thoughts that cause the emotional afflictions to rise and to cause your mind to be polluted. Then within that mind, you have to learn that, because that mind is one, shamatha is a mind which is just single-pointedly concentrated on one thing. It's not analyzing. It's just looking, it's just imagining Buddha's form or watching the nature of the mind or something else, or meditating on love, not by thinking, you know, how wonderful it would be that everyone was happy, but having thought that way, first, first of all, analyzing, holding the taste of that, right? Shamatha is just single-pointed placement meditation where there's no discursive thought and the mud has sunk. Then you have to be able to later develop the ability to analyze within that calm pool of water, that calm mind. It's like placing a fish, a little teeny fish, in my case, big, big, gross one, into that pond and then start it analyzing. What's going to happen, first of all, when you put an unskillful push fish in the pond, it's going to, by it swimming around, it's going to go whoosh, whoosh. It's going to bring up some of the mud again and cause little ripples on the surface. So when, even when one has developed shamatha, if one tries then to use that shamatha to analyze within it, you start losing your stability. So you have to develop this greater faculty that's called vipassana, penetrative insight. That's likened to the ability then 
for that fish of analysis to very skillfully go through there, no longer causing any turbulence that brings up the discursive the thoughts, the emotions, or causing, causes turbulence to the mind. So when you have those two together, that calm, calm mind within which you're analyzing, that's called the union of shamatha and vipassana. Right? You've heard that before, right? Tranquil abiding and penetrative insight, or, or calm abiding, penetrative insight. So that is the necessary empowering condition for yogic direct perce perception, yogic direct perceiver. <coughs> that which it, it is, it is generated is something which is generated in dependence upon its own uncommon empowering condition, namely the meditative stabilization, the samadhi, which is a union of shamatha and vipassana. So it ha that has to be there. So. Can you have that before you're an Arya being? Because supposedly only Aryas have yogic direct perception, right? Can you have a can you have a union of penetrative insight and uh, calm abiding? Dirty, what do you think? Before you reach the state of an Arya? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. That's a good answer. Okay, and no, I don't have any experience either, but I'm just wondering if you know. What do you think? Only Aryas have that kind of... What do you think, Dan? I'm not sure. Not sure. The, um, I think even, even non-Buddhists can have a, a union of penetrative insight and calm abiding, calm abiding penetrative insight. Um, especially the worldly Vipassana. You know, that's analyzing the lower realm, the grossness of this realm that we're in, and the, and the more subtlety of the form realm that helps to separate from attachment to this realm. They can actually achieve the, the, the so-called jhanas. Have you heard of that? The jhanas? So what do they call them? What did people used to translate them as? Trances, I think, some of the earlier times. Have you heard that? The trances. Going into trance. Um, it's actually dhyana in, in uh, Sanskrit. So I think in Pali it comes out jhanas. I think it's referring to the same thing. So one can have those. One can have a union of penetrative insight and calm abiding even before one <coughs> enters into the path, into the Buddhist path, as a non-Buddhist. But here the second part is it's an other-knowing, exalted knower. So it's not a self-knower. That's why it says other-knowing. Uh, and exalted knower is this word yeshe, or uh, jnana. What's the word? Do you know how we translate that? Gnosis? could translate it as gnosis, because jnana is, in Sanskrit, is kind of like j, n, with the umlaut. That's how you kind of pronounce it. Oh, not umlaut. What do you call it? Tilde over it. Jnana. Jnana, and the Sanskrit scholars that I know say that nowadays people pronounce it kind of like jnana, almost like gh. So it, there, it is related to our word gnosis, which, which is also related with the word to know, but gnosis, like g-n-o-s-i-s, which kind of refers to what? What does gnosis refer to? There was a Brazilian girl the other day who had all, who knew all about English grammar. I wish she was here tonight. What was it, Claudia or something? Something like direct perception? Gnosis is kind of like a higher kind of knowing, isn't it? Like something that knows something more profound. And that's kind of what yeshe, the Tibetan word yeshe, like lama yeshe, is the word jnana, which is translated as gnosis or exalted wisdom here. So here it, it means this yeshe, or exalted knower is something that is just not an ordinary consciousness, is something that is conducive to our spiritual development. So that's kind of the implication of it here, I think. It's an other knowing gnosis, or yeshe, or exalted knower, in the continuum of an Arya being, someone who's a superior, which is free from conceptuality, so it's going to be a direct perception, and non mistaken, so it's not a not a mistaken 
perceiving mind. Does that make sense? When yogic direct perceivers are divided, there are one way of dividing them, there's two prime and subsequent cognizers, which are yogic direct perceivers. Remember before, for all the other direct perceivers, we had three divisions. What was the third one? Inattentive or yeah, right, a, a, a consciousness to which an object appeared but was not ascertained. Here, it says there are no awarenesses to which an object appears but is not ascertained, which are yogic direct perceivers, because whatever is a yogic direct perceiver necessarily ascertains its object of comprehension. That means it's never kind of inattentive. It's like really, according to these tenets, the way that this interpretation, not everyone accepts that exactly, but in a yogic direct perceiver knows its object and is not going to be kind of like spaced out. Right? It's, it's there. And then it gives a reason for that. It says, this is because Dharma Kirti's commentary on Dignaga's Compendium of Prime Cognition. So this is the one I was talking about before, Pramana Vartika. So Dharma Kirti was the disciple of Dignaga. Dignaga was, you know who Dignaga was the disciple of? Who's, who's the, the historian here? Don? Dignaga was a disciple, I think, of Vashubandhu. Remember, you know, Sangha and Vashubandhu were brothers? And Vashubandhu had this one disciple called Stiramati. You remember this? He, when, he was, when he was reciting in his cave, when, I, when Vashubandhu was reciting the Abhidharma, I think he was reciting, reciting Abhidharma Kosha that he'd composed, and there was this pigeon up in the rocks, and the pigeon was just there eating its seeds or sitting there, whatever. And just by the force of it hearing this, must have paid some attention. It wasn't completely inattentive. Must have paid some attention. In its next, as soon as it died, it was reborn as a little boy in the valley. And uh, when he was very young, he wanted to find his guru. It was to, and it was called Stiramati. And because of the force of having heard the Abhidharma recited, he became even greater than Vasubandhu in the Abhidharma. So, even if you're just sitting here, you'll undoubtedly be much better than I in uh, low rig the next life, you know, just by the force of listening to it. Um, and one of his other disciples, so Vasubandhu had several disciples who excelled him in various subjects, and uh, one of them was Dignaga, who excelled him in logic. Dignaga was a great logician, so he's a, I think he was a disciple of Vasubandhu. His disciple, sort of like, maybe not, I'm not sure if he actually studied with Dignaga or was a little bit after, was called Dharmakirti. So Dharmakirti, very, very famous. These two, Dignaga and Dharmakirti, are the famous uh, Buddhist logicians that, whose texts we read. So here it says in Dharmakirti's commentary on the compendium of, of prime cognition, that which, which was composed by Dignaga, it says, just from seeing the great intelligent ones ascertain all aspects. So this is a quotation that's, that's used. It's talking about the great intelligent ones being the bodhisattvas. And just from seeing, it means it's referring to this kind of yogic direct perception. So then it says, although subsequent cognizers that are yogic direct perceivers exist, the second moment and so forth of an omniscient exalted wisdom, because we do have two divisions, right? Prime and subsequent cognition, yogic direct perceivers. Yogic direct perceiver that's a direct perceiver, and then the second instant of that and so forth that are subsequent cognizers. But for the omniscient mind, the exalt, ex, omniscient exalted wisdom, there is no such thing as a subsequent cognizer. So that's something we'll talk about after the break. Because every instant of a omniscient consciousness engages its objects by its own power, even the second instant and the third instant. It's according to these terms. Something special about the omniscient mind. So let's take a little break. Relax. Let your mind relax. Very easily satisfied tonight. I thought you'd need more, no? more of a break. Don didn't even get up. Diane didn't even get up. Did you? Oh, did you? Okay, good. 
Okay, good. Does anyone need one? You, Thea, did you get something? Okay. Don, do you need to get something? No. Okay, okay. Okay. So here now, we're in the middle of page 17. Although subsequent cognizers <clears throat> that are yogic direct receivers exist, because we just said there's two, two divisions, prime and subsequent cognizers, right? The second moment and so forth, the third moment, the fourth moment, tenth moment, of an omniscient exalted wisdom, the uh, omniscient mind, which is, one could say, is a yogic di direct perceiver. That's the reason it's being brought up here. Because if you ask what kind of consciousness is the omniscient mind, it would be a yogic direct perception, according to these tenets. But the second moment of it is not a subsequent cognizer, nor is the third or fourth, because whatever is an omniscient exalted wisdom is necessarily a prime cognizer. That means, from this point of view, it's not like a train of thought in the, in the continuum of ordinary beings, only the first instant of which has a certain vibrancy, like the engine of a train that is capable of pulling the subsequent moments along. Every moment of the omniscient mind is like an engine, you might say, is capable of knowing by its own power that object. That's how these tenets are, are seeing it, so which has a certain kind of validity in other uh, the upper schools too. The omniscient mind is different. It knows, it knows everything by direct perception. It, in fact, there is no conceptual mind. Did you know that? Buddha has no concepts. You know that? Doesn't have any thoughts. Does that sound contradictory to you? No mental images? Would there be any problem with it? You're thinking. You experience everything directly. Huh? That's a problem. Concept, concept and visual images is that the same? Concept is the process by which which uses visual and mental images. Yeah, it's the in uh, like uh, conceptual mind is knows its object, conceives of objects via some kind of mental image. It doesn't have to be visual, it could be verbal, but often we think of it as we call it, we call it mental image, we could call it that meaning generality. So and and so this is he, he uh, qualifies this. This is Purbachok's text. So Purbachok's the great Galupa. So he, he uses uh, the quotation of one of Lama Tsongkhapa's two main disciples, Gyaltsepche. Do you know the two disciples of Lama Tsongkhapa? Do you know, Chris? Have you seen the Tankas? Yeah, but I'm not going to be able to remember right now. I'm on the spot. Okay, now you, can, uh, you visualize, right? There's Lama Tsongkhapa, and then there's two disciples on either side of him, right? Just like Shakyamuni has two disciples. And they say many of the great beings, the Buddhas, when they appear, they'll always have two main disciples. So here's the two disciples of Lama Tsongkhapa. The special ones were called Gelsup Dharma Rinchen, or, or Gelsup Che, and, um, what is it called? And uh, Kedup, what? Kedup what? Kedup? J? Yeah, no, yeah, Kedup J, short, but Kedup what? Yeah, I can't remember what the rest of his name is. Kedup, right off, offhand. So, one of them looks older and has a sort of more compassionate face. It's supposed to be emanation, Kalsip is supposed to be emanation of Avalokiteshvara. And um, like when we do the mantra of Lama Tsongkhapa, Mignay Sewe Te Chen Chen Rezi, there's three deities that are mentioned, right? Avalokiteshvara, Manjushri, and Vajrapani. So Lama Tsongkhapa is supposed to be an emanation of Manjushri, Gelsip Che is like the emanation of Avalokiteshvara, Chenrezi, and uh, Kedrup Che is, uh, is, if you see in the Tankas or in the statues, he's the one with the big eyes, like this, sort of like, you know, sort of like Vajrapani. And he's the one that was the more, more famous for all of the tantric uh, teachings. He's the one that had the visions after Lama Tsongkhapa had the great visions of Lama Tsongkhapa and many different times he, he would, felt so sad when Lama Tsongkhapa passed away, his guru, that he, he respected so much that he cried and 
prayed that he come, and he actually had visions of Lama Tsongkhapa as a great Mahasiddha, and uh, amazing, amazing things. So here he's quoting, uh, because he's Gulukpa, Prabhupada is quoting to prove this, Gelsabche, because Lama Tsongkhapa and his two disciples are kind of, like in the Gulukpa tradition, are considered authoritative. Even though there's some, you might see some small contradiction between Gelsabche and Kedrup Jay's teachings in general, they all take Lama Tsongkhapa's explanation as perfect. So this is because, this is so, that is the omniscient mind never has subsequent cognizer, it always is a direct perceiver, because Gelsab Jay's text says so. A particular text called, his explanation of uh, this dark text by Dharmakirti, which is called, the title of Gelsab Jay's text is Unmistaken Illumination of the Path to Liberation. So he said, in that text, he says, no matter how much I turn inside and think about it, I do not feel that an omniscient exalted wisdom is not pervaded by being a new realizer. This is, the Tibetans love to have double negatives, you know. So what is he saying? Don, what is he saying? There's no new realizer, it's a continuum. There's no new realizer? Exalted wisdom is not pervaded by being a new realizer is not pervaded by being a new realizer. In other words, an omniscient wisdom is necessarily a new realizer. Is that right? You forgot the other, the, neg the negative is at the beginning. I do not feel. That's what I think it's like, it's really, like, sometimes drive you crazy, you know, all these ne double, nego, triple negatives. I do not feel that an omniscient mind Ex ex omniscient exalted wisdom is not pervaded by being a new realizer. If it were not pervaded, if it were pervaded by a new, being a new realizer, that would mean it's necessarily a new, a reali a new realizer. Right? Here it says, not pervaded by being that. But he says, I don't feel that it is not pervaded. So that means I do feel that it is pervaded. I do feel it is a new realizer. Also, Kedrup, Kedrup J. Kato Rinpoche is clearing away the darkness of mind with respect to the treatises on private cognition. This is a little, nice little text that we've studied sometime. I think some parts of it. Yiki Munso, eliminating the darkness of mind. In that text he says, if, some, if something became a subsequent cognizer, merely through its object being apprehended by a former prime cognizer, it would follow that the second and subsequent moments of the omniscient exalted wisdom would be subsequent cognizers. There exist many such flaws as will be indicated below. So he's, maybe he's criticizing a particular definition of subsequent cognizer as being uh, that which realizes what was realized before. Because it doesn't follow for the Buddha, does, does it? Because the Buddha's one, one moment of consciousness realizing something, the next instant of consciousness realizes what was just realized, but it's not a subsequent cognizer. It is still a prime cognizer. Okay, enough of that. So the reason for, uh, in this case, for giving these four definitions of direct sense perceivers, self-knowing direct perceivers, what else? What say? A mental direct perceiver, self-knowing direct perceivers, yogic direct perceivers, is now to give the actual definitions of prime cognizers. The definite, there, remember there were four kinds of prime cognizers? Do you remember that? came out a little bit earlier. On, uh, oh, actually, two kinds of prime cognizers. Direct and inferential, on page 14. When prime cognizers are divided, there are two, direct and inferential pog prime cognizers. And so, to talk about direct prime cognizers, now there's going to be four kinds of direct prime cognizers. So the general direct prime cognizer, so it's going to be a prime cognizer, which is a direct perception, is a new incontrovertible knower that is free of conceptuality. Incontrovertible means it realizes its object, and free of conceptuality prevents this direct prime cognizer from being any kind of conceptual mind, right, from being an inference or anything like that. So it's pretty simple. When direct prime cognizers are divided, there are four, just as we had for uh, direct perceivers. Self-knowing, here it puts the order a little bit different. Self-knowing, sense, mental, and yogic. 
direct prime cognizers. This is all pretty clear, right? This is just sort of elaborating now, adding to the definition of uh, direct perceivers the qualification of being what? What's the, what's the special thing about a prime cognizer? It has to be what? New and incontrovertible, right? Is that the word it uses here? Incontrovertible, right? Uh, not deceived, in other words, with respect to this. So it realizes. So here, the definition of a self-knowing direct perceiver, or, or a self-knowing direct prime cognizer, is a new incontrovertible knower, free of conceptuality, which is directed only inward and is just an apprehender. Does that have enough? What's, what's added here? From the, what's different from the definition of a self-knowing direct perceiver? Let's look at these pages. Just an Where did we have here? Mental direct perceiver, page 15, 16, right? A self-knowing direct perceiver is that which has the aspect of an apprehender, is free of conceptuality, and is non-mistaken. And we have to add to that incontrovertible and what? Directed inward. No, from just the, the previous word. Free of conceptuality, right? Well, that's, that's, that makes it a direct prime cognizer. The main thing for prime cognizer here is new and incontrovertible. So it says a new incontrovertible knower. So compare the rest with the definition earlier that is free from conceptuality, that's in both of them, right? <coughs> Which is directed only inward and is just an apprehender. So it's phrased differently. The other one said that which has the aspect of an apprehender. And this one says which is directed only inward and is just an apprehender. What's, what's missing out of this new this definition on page 18, self-knowing direct prime cognizer? There's something missing from the other one. Which is directed only inward. This has that. What's missing? What's the, what's the one on page 16 have that this doesn't have? Not mistaken. Not mistaken. So is that wrong? Did the, did the author leave that out? Yeah, so let's check if it's what Mark, right? Mark is saying, remember earlier we said those two things were redundant. They didn't have to both be there. But you couldn't just say uh, free from, say, for a direct perceiver. You couldn't just say uh, free from conceptuality because also a mistaken sense consciousness is free from conceptuality. Like, say, a sense consciousness that sees a blue snow mountain or two moons or has some other kind of error. That is free from conceptuality, but it is mistaken. So it, you could say it is not mistaken, and that would cover both. But you couldn't just say free from conceptuality. But here it says free from conceptuality. It doesn't say non-mistaken, right? So is that, did I get myself in trouble by saying that? Do you see what I'm saying? I do. I have to settle for a minute. Okay. <laughs> what did you say? You have to settle for a minute? Yep. Okay, you've got a grok. You've got a grok first. <laughs> got a grok. <laughs> what do you do, Dan? Do you grok? Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, okay. Has anyone grokked this yet? Bonnie, have you grokked this? I'm not afraid. I'm afraid. I, it's going to take me so many weeks to get everyone's. What's your name? This young Pat. Pat, have you grokked this yet? Um, I'm about GR. <laughs> I haven't got the okay yet. Oh, you haven't, you haven't? Oh, I see. It's not okay yet. I see grok. I thought it was okay. GR okay. Your GR. Okay. 
So some of you, I think some of you had a insight here. Let's say, for instance, the earlier one said free from conceptuality, non mistaken. This one says uh, that is free of conceptuality, right? It doesn't say non mistaken, but it does say new incontrovertible. If something is incontrovertible, will it also be non mistaken? Yes. If it's something is non controvertible, it'll be non mistaken? How about how about a inferential cognizer, you know, correct inference. Is it incontrovertible? Say it, it's realizing via mental image, um, subtle impermanence, yogic direct perceiver, let's say. I don't know, let's say a, a yogic direct perceiver. Yogic direct perceiver. Let's say an inferential cognizer that's realizing impermanence. Is that incontrovertible? It's realizing its object, right? But it's, but it's mistaken, isn't it? Because it's it's mistaken with respect to its appearing object. So do you see? Are you thinking? Are you grokking yet? Okay. So here, if you put, if you have, if you say something is free from conceptuality and incontrovertible. Free from conceptuality and incontrovertible, that will exclude mistaken direct perce um, sense perce perception, right? So that would include then, in that case, you don't have to say mistaken. You don't have to say non mistaken. Did you get that, Chris? That too? Yes. Pretty good, you got that. Okay. So a self-knowing, so what else is different here? A self-knowing direct prime cognizer is a new incontrovertible knower that is free from conceptuality and which is directed only inward. Before it said, has the, which has the aspect of an apprehender. Zinnam, we say in Tibetan, has the aspect of an apprehender. Here it says two things, which is directed only inward and just an apprehender. I think means that which is directed inward and it, an apprehender that is directed inward means a self-knower because an other knower, the other way of talking about it is directed outwards. Something that is directed inwards doesn't mean, you know, somewhere back, it means toward itself, just apprehending itself as opposed to apprehending what is outside of itself. So that's the same as has the same meaning, another way of saying. I think you could just you could also say here, uh, which is, um, which has the aspect of an apprehender instead of those two phrases. You could say a self-knowing direct prime cognizer is a new and incontrovertible knower, free from conceptuality, uh, which is which has the aspect of an apprehender. Okay, you check. Then the definition of a sense direct prime cognizer, let's see here, a new incontrovertible knower, free of conceptuality, which, is, which arises in dependence upon a physical sense power that is its uncommon empowering condition. So again, what's missing is mistaken, but that's okay because if it says free from conceptuality and incontrovertible, it'll have to be non-mistaken. Right, Dordie? Does that make sense? Think about that for a second. You got it? You grokking this? I'm not grokking at all. Okay, just grok this for a moment. Non-conceptual, free from conceptuality. Okay, so it's not a conceptual mind. So that means all the different kinds of sense or mental perceivers, some of which are mistaken, some of which are non-mistaken. But if it's incontrovertible, that means it's realizing its object. That means the object that it is apprehending actually exists. It is knowing it. So it can't be a mistaken consciousness then. So you don't have to add the word non-mistaken here. There won't be that. You know, no need to say that. When sense direct prime cognizers are divided, there are five sense direct prime cognizers. Apprehending forms and so forth. What is, so what does that mean? 
What are the five sense direct prime cognizers? So an eye prime cognizer and an ear direct prime cognizer and nose, so forth, right? The five consciousnesses. Because it's just talking about the senses. Then a mental direct prime cognizer is a new incontrovertible knower free of conceptuality which arises in dependence on a mental sense power that is its uncommon empowering condition. Now your minds are so sharp, easy, right? Right? Mar is it Marcy, right? Or Dar Dar Marcy. Easy, right? You caught me a little beyond. Oh, no, okay. No. no, I thought you were I thought you were just, you were looking at Chris saying, so easy, why do we, even, why is he even going through these, so, this, so obvious now that we did those, we spent so much mental effort on the other ones. These are easy now, really, because it's just adding some parts, right? So good, it's just a yawn. Then when mental direct cognizers are divided, there are six mental direct prime cognizer apprehending forms of So this one is for Carrie. Carrie. How could there be six? There were only five for the mental direct. How does, for the sense direct prime cognizers, how does mental have six? It goes on to explain it. It doesn't. It'd be interesting. Yeah, it'd be interesting if that little microphone and that could actually. Maybe that's the solution. Can you have that on at the same time, or is it? You can't cut. It cuts off because then we could get the people's responses back. Would anyone know? Well, is it? I mean, I have a mental conception of a smell or a taste. But that's not a mental direct perceiver, right? This is a mental direct prime cognizer. What were the mental direct perceivers? What were the examples? Remember, all of them. Mental, sense, mental, yogic, self knowing. No, I said, what are the mental direct perceivers? The examples, what, what were different examples? Clairvoyance, what else? dream consciousness, although we didn't talk about it on this occasion. But also, remember there was one instance of a mental direct perceiver in the continuum of ordinary beings at the end of a train, or at the beginning of a train, what is it, the beginning, the end of the train of sense direct perception. According to these tenets, there's one instant of mental direct perception. So how many objects is this, does it have? It, the ones that watch eye consciousness have visual forms, the ones that watch ear consciousness have sounds, smells, tastes, tactile objects, and then the, the mental direct perceivers that are knowing a previous instant of mental consciousness would be the sixth one. So I think that's what's being referred to there when it says there are six kinds of mental, six mental direct prime cognizers apprehending forms and so forth. That's kind of interesting, though. Could they be prime cognizers in the continuum of ordinary beings? What was the thing about those those mental direct perceivers? I'm going to make a note here. I'm going to write a note to Perbachok. What are you saying? How can you say that? I'm joking. I can't say that to Perbachok. He's I'm supposed to be emanation of Maitreya. Please forgive me. Six mental direct perceivers. Well, do you see my point? If they're, if they're only inattentive, how can they be prime cognizers? Prime cognizers have to realize their object, right? Remember, direct, there were mental direct perceivers in the continuum of, of ordinary beings. Remember, there were, how many divisions were there of mental direct perceivers? There's a three. three. Prime, subsequent, and inattentive. So most of ours are inattentive. The ones that are direct, the ones that are prime and subsequent would be ones like clairvoyance. But how about, no, that's not talking about apprehending forms and so forth. The ones that apprehend forms and so forth would for the most part be inattentive, wouldn't they? 
because those are the ones that come at the end of the trains of the sense perceptions. So maybe something to think about. Did I make? Did I go too far in teasing, Prabhupada? Is he referring to omniscient minds in this way? Because in which case there would be no sense, but cognizers of any sort would all be prime. Oh, he says when mental direct prime cognizers. Because th we're talking about prime cognizers, we're not talking about subsequent ones. So prime cognizers are not subsequent anyway. And they're not, prime cognizers are not inattentive. Okay? So only talking about prime ones. So? I guess I was making an inference from earlier when we were talking about omniscient minds having no subsequent cognizers. Mm -hmm. Well, here we're not talking about subsequent. We're just talking about prime. The, the, the inference I was making is that they're all prime cognizers. So, so all the, the mental direct perceiver of the Buddha's mind is what you're saying, right. apprehends some. Yeah, one could say that. One could say that, I think. So maybe, maybe, maybe that's the solution. Okay? Then the definition of the fourth, the yogic direct prime cognizer is, let's see what's different about this now, an other-knowing exalted knower. Do you have the, the yogic direct perceiver definition there? An other, so if you look at part point two on page 17, so it says other-knowing exalted knower in the continuum of the superior, right, which is, which in dependence upon a meditative stabilization that is a union of calm abiding and special insight and is its uncommon empowering condition, it, the way it's phrased, because it's, it's going to use that to, do, to have a particular realization, newly and directly realizes either subtle impermanence or the coarse or subtle selflessness of persons. The other one said it's an other-knowing exalted wisdom in the continuum of a superior. We have that here, right? Which is free from conceptuality and non-mistaken and generated in dependence on its own uncommon empowering condition of meditative stabilization, which is a union of combining and special insight. So it has that part, but it doesn't say which is free from conceptuality and non-mistaken. So is this definition wrong? Before we said it didn't have to say non-mistaken if it said incontrovertible and free of conceptuality, right? Well, isn't it just that it's in the continuum of superior? Well, the other one said in the continuum of a superior, right? Yeah. And it did have to say um, free from conceptuality and not mistaken. So if it, maybe if you say it directly realizes something, what does that imply? It's incontrovertible, because to realize means to be incontrovertible, okay? Newly is there, newly realizes, so that was necessary for a uh, prime cognizer, so that the new incontrovertibility is there, newly and is, is new and incontrovertible with respect to either subtle impermanence or the coarse or subtle selfless of the persons. But what about uh, free from conceptuality and non-mistaken? We still don't, is it, is it clear yet why it's free from conceptuality? Because it's an other knowing exalted knower which eliminates free from conceptuality. Other knowing exalted knower. The other, the other definition also had that, didn't it? An other knowing exalted knower in the continuum of the superior, which is free from conceptuality and unmistaken. So other knowing, that can be, even conceptions are other knowers. So that doesn't imply, other knowing doesn't imply that it's, uh, it just means it's not a self-knower. If it's, if it's realizing, it's free from conceptual way? Mm -hmm. If it's realizing, it's directly. directly realizing, yeah, directly realizing. So, 
here it's a little bit funny because uh, if you look later in in uh, Lati Rinpoche's book, uh, according to the the terminology here, there's a difference between directly realizing and realizing uh, via a direct perception. Actually, this probably means via a direct perception. This is a little bit, a little bit. When it said directly realizes, you might circle that for a little question mark because, um, according to these tenets, the coarse or subtle selflessness of persons is not something which is is not the appearing object when you realize, say, if you have a realization of selflessness of persons, okay? See if you can grok this now, yeah? When you realize selflessness of persons, what's appearing to that consciousness? If you have a direct realization of that, what's appearing to that consciousness? Can it be an impermanent phenomena? Or can it be a permanent phenomena? According to these tenets? Direct realization? No. According to Sautrantika, the appearing object of direct perception has to be an impermanent phenomena. It has to be impermanent. So that direct re perception realizes the impermanent aggregates and indirectly knows that they are free of a permanent, partless, independent person. Let's say if you're talking about that the gross selflessness of persons, or realizes, in, indirectly realizes that they're free of a self-supporting, substantially existent person. It doesn't directly realize that. It realizes, that in the terminology in Lati Rinpoche's book here, in, in uh, the way he uh, explains the terminology of the Geshe, whose text is explained there, he says there's a difference between, you could say there's a difference between realizing with a direct perception. Here, like this is yogic direct perception is realizing with a direct perception, but it's not realizing directly. It's realizing indirectly. So that's why you could you might be you could make some you could make some subtle choice here. You could say realizing with a direct perception either subtle impermanence or the coarse or subtle selflessness of persons. Isn't the, the union of special insight and calm abiding in its uncommon empowering condition, isn't that the direct perception? Isn't that applying the direct perception? No, because on the path of, let's say, on the path of preparation, remember the five paths, path of accumulation, path of preparation, you remember the demarcation for the beginning of the path of preparation? For the beginning of the path of preparation? Mm -hmm. When does a bodhisattva or, let's say, the hero or solitary realizer enter into the path of preparation? When they have a union of tranquil abiding and meditative insight, meditating on selflessness, let's say, or let's say on emptiness in the case of bodhisattva and the higher tenet, via a mental image. So that's an inferential cognizer on the, on the basis of <clears throat> penetrative, uh, penetrative, a union of penetrative insight and meditative, and uh, penetrative insight, I was saying, a union of tranquil abiding and penetrative insight doesn't have to be a direct perceiver. A yogic di direct perceiver on the basis of that kind of, that kind of stabilized mind can still have a mental image. But in a yogic direct perception, that previous, what was previously an inferential cognizer that was based on that calm pool of water and the little fish of analysis, that can still be knowing its object by a mental image. But then it, when it becomes a yogic direct perceiver, it's realizing it via a direct perception. The mental image disappears and so, in other words, the uh, union of this yoga, this union of calm abiding and penetrative insight, is not sufficient to say it's a direct perception, because there are many instances that are conceptual, that's a, that are 
that union of penetrative insight and calm abiding. So the directly here, or with direct perception, eliminates conceptuality, and because it's realized, that means it's incontrovertible and also non-mistaken. So everything's there. Do you grok that? I'm glad I learned that. Thanks, Carrie, Car for that. Yeah. Did you grok that? Okay. So it's necessarily directly realizing? Or... Well, it depends on what you mean. Here, the way that uh, in Tibetan we'd say ngunsum du or ngunsum gi. Ngunsum gi, the, the gi in, in, implies via or by means of ngunsum, direct perception. Ngunsum du means directly. Here, I don't have the text in front of me, probably doesn't say ngunsum du. It probably doesn't say directly. It probably, probably says by means of, well, I'm not sure, I'll have to check probably means by means of a direct perception, because it doesn't realize um, the subtle selflessness of persons, of course, subtle, of course, selflessness of persons directly. It realizes them indirectly, unless, according to Prabhupada's tenets, that by directly he means via a direct perception, and he uses a different word to differentiate that you're not actually, it's not actually appearing directly to that. Because there is a, it's it's an implicit realization, an indirect realization, in that case. Prasangika doesn't say that. Prasangika says a direct perception can have permanent phenomena as it as its object. Right? Direct perceivers can know permanent phenomena. Only for the Sautrantic, as they say, no, no. All it can know, all a direct perceiver can know, are in are impermanent phenomena. So what about this one realizes subtle impermanence? That's something is, which itself is impermanent, right? So it can know that both directly and via the direct perception. But the other two, the course of subtle self, this is a person's, or if in the Mahayana sense, emptiness, it couldn't, according to them, according to Sartrantis, Sautrantika, it can know that with the direct perception, it's, it's that direct perception that's realizing something that's impermanent and indirectly sort of like you see that directly with your mind and you know indirectly, implicitly, what you're understanding that is void of something that's permanent or self-supporting and substantially existent and so forth. Do you grok that? Okay. Yeah, I know you see everything as indirect. <laughs> I don't know that, I just, with direct perception, but anyway, let's go a little bit further. So, just, we'll just introduce something here a little bit further. So, the ex so when yogic direct, perceive, direct prime cognizers are divided, there are three. Prime cognizers directly realizing subtle impermanence, coarse selflessness of persons, and the subtle selflessness of persons. Here, according to these tenets, does anyone know, Karen, do you know what this, according to Sautrantika, the subtle selflessness of persons is, or the gross selflessness of persons? Is it the person being empty of true existence? I guess I, even out of the corner of my eye, indirectly I'm sensing Chris sitting up a little bit straighter, as he may know the answer to this. Oh, okay. I thought I thought I saw you. Okay. Bonnie, mm -hmm. Diane. Okay. So according to Sautrantika, it's it's different than according to the Mahayana certainly, because Mahayana says uh, this. Well, let's say the Prasangika take the highest school. They say the subtle selfless of per, selflessness of persons is that the person is empty of being truly existent, right? And there's a gross selflessness of persons that, even if it's eliminated, doesn't bring you to the Arya state, but it can, it, it's useful in subduing the delusions, and that is that the person is empty of being self-supporting, 
or in other words substantially existent in this certain sense of substantially existent something which is able to support itself that different than true existence for the sautrantikas here that self-supporting substantially existent the realization of the emptiness of that or the lack of that is the subtle selflessness selflessness of persons they have something even grosser than that that they call the gross selflessness of person which is um, that the person is empty of being permanent partless and independent which are the attributes of the atma like in the hindu in the in the the, how do you call it? the uh, tenets of the Vedic schools, the Atma, the Self, is something which is permanent, sort of eternal, it's partless, it doesn't have any kind of components, and it is independent of other things. So the Buddhists, that is, is something that would be called from the higher tenets just an intellectually formed ignorance something that's come about because of tenets, because it's not something that we innately, naturally think from our own side. It's something that someone has, that we would learn, or something that, that has come about because of uh, exposure to different kind of philosophical schools. From the Prasangika point of view, that per, the lack of a permanent partless, or let's say the apprehension of a permanent partless independent person that kind of ignorance is not intellectually formed. It's some, uh, it, is, isn't, it is intellectually formed. There's no kind of innate form of that that, that that animals naturally have. I am, you know, I am permanent, I am partless, I am independent. But for, this, for these tenets, that is what's called the, the coarse or gross selflessness of persons, the realization that the, per, the person is devoid of a permanent, partless, independent person. Does that make sense? That's the coarse or gross selflessness of persons. The subtle selfless of per, selflessness of persons is that the person is devoid of being substantially existent in the sense of being self-supporting self-supporting substantially existent what does that mean actually you have to inquire quite a bit to figure out what in in the various is that something that's explained usually right at the beginning i think one thing that it means is that there are uh, we can say, like according to the lower tenets here, especially, there are two kinds of phenomena. Uh, those that are substantially existent and those that are designatedly existent or imputedly existent. I'm glad Don put down his pencil. He's really paying attention. I was really grokking. He says, wait a second. What's he getting at? Everything's imputedly existent, right? Prasenkika says everything's imputedly existent. So forget that. Be like a baby. Sort of new mind. Um, according to the lower, all the Hinayana schools, and even, even uh, some of the higher schools, some phenomena substantially exist. That is to say, by merely seeing them, one thing, you see that thing. Other things are imputedly existent. And by, like for instance, uh, a forest is something that is imputedly existent. Because a forest is something, a forest is comprised of trees. If you only see some of the trees, you don't see the whole forest, right? Oh, we're talking about not seeing the forest for the trees. Remember this thing we all often talk about? Another thing, example, classic example that's given that something that's imputedly existent is an army. You see the individual soldiers, maybe some soldiers are coming by your place, you say, the army is passing, but it's only part of the army. Army is something that's imputed onto a collection of soldiers or soldierettes. I'm not sure what the right term is. <laughs> Soldier, okay. Um, 
A rosary is something that's imputed onto the collection of parts, the beads and the string and so forth, arranged in a certain way. Any one, you can't find the rosary in any one of the parts. So this is what the lower tenets would say. They say that one of the misperceptions that we have about the self is that the self is substantially existent, whereas the self is only imputedly existent. It, like a forest, like a rosary, like an army, is just imputed on to the collection of the five aggregates. And there is no substantially existent self the way that the mind perceives. Now you might say, well, that sounds like emptiness to me. Right? That's not as subtle as, as emptiness at all. It's very gross yet. But it certainly gets us in that direction. So for these tenets, for the Sautrantikas, the lack of a self-supporting, substantially existent person is the, the realization of the subtle selflessness of persons. So that and the gross selflessness of persons, the fact that the person is empty of being a permanent partner, an independent being, those that those two and subtle impermanence are the three kinds of objects that yogic direct perceivers take as their as their objects. Okay, so they realize them via direct perception, but in, they don't realize all three of them directly in another sense because they realize two of them indirectly, implicitly, you might say. It doesn't appear, what appears to them is actually an impermanent phenomena, the aggregates that are devoid of being permanent. Karen, are you grokking this? Not sure. Was that? Not sure? Not sure. Go on. <laughs> That's, oh, okay. I thought you were talking in the same kind of language as grokking. I was like, not sure, but it sounded like one of those records, like sometimes when I play when Dorji and I are, are doing the videos, like if you play something backwards, something comes out. Sound, almost sounds like something, but it's backwards. You know, almost sounds like. Did you know that in the the Star Wars? Do you remember the Star Wars? The where the little Ewoks. Ewoks. Is that what they were? The Tibetan they're they're speaking backwards. They they they, they recorded Tibetan and they played it backwards. <laughs> the one one point in it. I can't remember exactly what said. It was something like, hey, Lo Song. You could actually hear that it's correct about they didn't put it backwards. Maybe for, maybe they made a mistake or maybe they did it on purpose. But the, if you play back the Ewoks, is that what they're? Ewoks? Speech. You can check. I'm sure all of you will be up late tonight checking this. Okay. So that, that finishes that section. And let's just go a little bit further now. The facsimiles of direct perception. This is the word facsimile is uh, what we, in Tibetan, we say tarnang. Tar means like. Nang means appearing. So appearing like, something which appears to be direct perceptions, but are not. So the facsimile. A facsimile is something that, well, facsimiles are sometimes, like faxes are better than the real thing sometimes, aren't they? But here, a facsimile, the implication is something which is appears to be a direct perceiver, perceiver but, are not, but is not. And this comes from the, ter the terminology, again, from this literature, talking about in order to, all these different divisions to sh kind of sharpen our mind and understand things from all different directions. So the definition of a facsimile of direct perceiver is a knower which is mistaken with respect to its appearing object. A knower which is mistaken with respect to its appearing object. What kind of things does that, does that include? Marcy, do you have any idea? M mistaken with respect to, like, conceptions. Are they mistaken with respect to their appearing objects? Conceptions are because conceptual mind takes the appearing object it, as its, the, the mental image as its appearing object. And although it doesn't focus on that, it's actually knowing some other object via that mental image, and it, 
it is said to be mistaken because in, two, in various ways, in one in which the, the image is mixed with the, the image of this is mixed with the image that you're trying to realize, the object that you're trying to realize, and that you mistake this image to be the actual object. So it's mistaken in various ways of, of talking about it. So a knower which is mistaken with regard to its appearing object is necessarily a conceptual consciousness? What do you think? What? what do you think? Not necessarily. That's a good answer. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. What? Is it? That was the question. Yes. Yeah. Are you studying law? <laughs> <laughs> Are you studying law? Yeah. No. No. Okay. <laughs> Here it says, a knower which is mistaken with regard to its appearing object. And I said, is that necessarily a conceptual mind? We talked about this many times, so you just, you're just probably forgetting. Could be also a non-conceptual mind that's mistaken with respect to its appearing object. Well, it's faulty, eye. faulty eye consciousness, faulty ear consciousness. It can be mistaken with respect to its appearing object in that it's a it's what appears to it, what, what seemingly appears to it is uh, not what is actually appearing to it. Like when, when one moon appears to your eye, but because you, your, your little brother or sister just banged you, or your partner in the dance just banged you in the eye, and you see two, uh, two moons now. Okay. So facsimiles of direct perceivers and mistaken consciousness are synonyms, the synonymous. So if something is, because it says it's mistaken with respect to its appearing object, that's what mistaken consciousness is, something that's mistaken with respect to its appearing object. Can something that's, mis can a mistaken consciousness realize anything? Georgie? This is old ground. <laughs> How else could it realize it? It would have to realize incontrovertibly. It definitely can. <laughs> Mistaken consciousness can realize its object. Example? A mental image? A mental image doesn't realize anything. Inference, inferential cognition, is a, is a conceptual mind. But it realizes its object. Even though it's, it has a mental image of what it's knowing, let's say subtle impermanence or selflessness, still, it if it's if it is a valid cognition, it realizes its object. Remember, there are two kinds of valid cognitions, prime cognizers. Inferential cognition and direct perceivers. So you can know things incontrovertibly, even with logic, with inference. So something can be mistaken, but incontrovertible. Remember, that was the point I was trying to make before. When Sometimes it didn't have both words in the, when it, in the definition of a direct perceiver because it said free of conceptuality and incontrovertible. You'll have to grok this so that we, in the next couple of days, okay? Get your mind around this. Okay. Okay. This is going good. So when facsimiles of direct perceivers are divided, there are seven. So I'm just going to go over these and then we'll, we'll, you'll think about these in the next couple of days. And you'll have them so clear next time that I can just... Uh, there's seven varieties. Six of them are conceptual, because conceptual ones almost seem, some of them can almost seem like the direct perceptions, and one of them is non-conceptual. What would be an example of a non-conceptual facsimile of direct perception? Well, like seeing, like seeing a... a like the, what do we call it, the 4th of July, the sparklers? Someone's going, making figure eight. It looks like there's a figure eight in space because of the, the quickness of the movement or fire brand. That would be a seemingly direct perception, but is not an actual direct perception of that. Okay, so that would be, that would be a mistaken, a wrong, uh, direct, uh, a wrong sense consciousness. Yeah. Tricky because it does. Because 
I don't see the atoms or the molecules of your body moving around. You appear to me to be some kind of solid thing, but is that mistaken? Or is that are we saying in this school that, that conventional reality is true, is real, correct? Good question. Let's check one of them. Like one of them in particular, I've always found a little bit, uh, a little bit controversial. For instance, one of the, <clears throat> uh, it, it comes a little bit further here. The, I think here the cause of error on the bottom of the page is it talking about the, the ways that non-conceptual facsimiles of, men, of direct perceivers can be, is what we're talking about now. Um, is it the second one, where it says the second, the cause of error existing in the abode is, for exi example, sitting in a boat for a sense consciousness which sees trees as moving. So, for instance, if you're sitting in a car or a boat, sometimes if you've ever, if you've ever sat in a boat, or it, it might seem like other things are moving, but actually you're moving, right? Is that really true? Actually, from uh, from point of view of physics, you're, it's completely relative. You can't say one of them is actually at rest. But the implication is that uh, there is some kind of state of rest, like the Earth is some kind of platform. But you could you could argue about that one also, the same kind of thing that you're arguing here, that there is no uh, for there's no one uh, place that you can say is absolutely at rest and everything else you could say are moving with respect to it. You can only say things are moving with respect to one another. So the thing about the firebrand also, uh, that's also, I think you're, you're, you know, you're good to point that out. Um, from a certain point of view, it seems as though there's a circle of fire. But if you were to have a, a uh, what do you call it, the kind of foot photography where slow motion, slow motion or stop, you know, or, or stroboscope, you would see that it is not a circle of fire. There are instances going around, and, and just like and just like on a movie, there are a, a whole succession of individual things. So that's like like an illusion. So that is not a an actual direct perception of of a circle of fire. But you can have a direct perception of a vase because you're not talking about, let's say, this jug or vase or whatever. Is that any less valid because the atoms are moving? But don't you then ask, to, to who? Is it to us, we humans, that see these things at this certain rate as normal, that that is matter in a vase? Or is it to an ant that is right next to the vase that doesn't see it as a vase at all? Or, I don't know, other kinds mm -hmm. of mind? So who else would see it as not as... So it depends on the karma. According to what we know of the six realms, all of the six realms, none of the six realms perceive subtle and permanence, right? It's, it's something that we know only Arya beings and only the Buddha can per perceive with, with the sense perceptions direct, subtle and permanence. So even the Aryas only can perceive it with their you know, yogic direct perception, subtle and permanence. So that it sort of goes along with just the conventional state that we all experience, that we don't perceive this. You're, you know, the, the succession of vases that are appearing moment by moment Regardless of the motion of the atoms, just the karmic appearance of that as something similar moment by moment. So the gang that sees the, um, the, the snow mountains as white beats up the gang. There's <laughs> a smaller number of people who sees it as a blue snow mountain because there's more of them? Um, that, that, so okay, so what do we consider? What do we consider to be conventional? You know, what is co what constitutes conventional truth? Uh, it's not just that it is. Dorji's holding up one finger. We got one minute left. <laughs> it's not just that it is. We'll have to do dedication. So if you're watching this video, you have to do your own dedication today. <laughs> Because we're going to do our dedication after the tape is over. 
unless he's capturing it on the on the maybe maybe they don't because we're capturing it on the computer also at the same time. So, um, yeah, someone might say, is it just by convention? Just what you know? Who, who you know? The majority of people who say that a certain color is green and people who are colorblind, they they get outvoted, right? Is it green that you, the colorblind people? What would they be colorblind of? Red or green? I don't know. Both. It looks gray. Both look gray. Or anyone colorblind here? But I'm not red green. What, what are you colorblind of? Shades. Shades. So I think one has to investigate what um, you know. When there's something that's colorblind, we can actually scientifically come to some kind of conclusion that there is something that, you know, the two different groups of people, one person says it's green, one says it's gray. And, but we could come to some kind of scientific conclusion that the people who say it's gray, in that case, are not perceiving in a, there's some defect in their sense base that prevents them from seeing what the other people are seeing. So you could come to, it's not as just, it's not just done by consensus, you know, uh, the Republicans say this has been a good war, and you know we Californians say this is baloney, and but because there's more Republicans or something, therefore it's a good war. It's not. It's not done like that. There are, in fact, most of those things are completely subjective, right? Most of those kinds of things. So, why don't you for for next time? Why don't you go over these seven? Uh, and try to read the next couple of sections through the the sources of error that uh, Chris has been bringing up here, and we're going to we're going to get into inferential prime cognizers. So up till now we've been talking about the prime cognizers, which are direct perceivers or the facsimiles of that, and in that case we're indirectly starting to talk about inference. Now next time we'll, we'll be talking about inference again which is the way, is an actual valid way of knowing things. We can actually realize emptiness with inference. We can realize subtle impermanence. We can realize all of the various important spiritual concepts via inference. Would that still be conceptual though? Inference would be necessarily conceptual. But the realization, would that be non-conceptual? The realization would still be conceptual. Okay, now you've got to grok this one. You have you obviously there's some things that are still not grokked. You have to get together with Carrie. So if it's something is a realization, if something is incontrovertible, it doesn't have to be a direct perception. There are two ways that we can realize things incontrovertibly, according to Buddhist Buddhism. You can realize them with a direct perception, which is what most people would think is the only way, but or you can realize it with inference. Some of the Vedic schools don't accept inference, or let's say, the, as they call the nihilists, or the uh, the Trav Tra Travakas, don't wouldn't accept that inference is a valid way of knowing. That you could actually realize something by inference, but uh, according to Buddhism, you can actually realize it. You can you can actually know the object perfectly. That's why you get a mental image of emptiness. At our stage right now, what we're trying to build up is a mental image of, let's say, selflessness or emptiness. Even though it's not a direct perception of emptiness, we have to approach the direct perception that way. And over time, by familiarizing with that, because emptiness itself is a hidden phenomenon, it can't be known directly with direct perception from the beginning. It's what's called a hidden phenomenon. Do you remember that difference between you, you were gone? I think on that time. manifest, hidden, and deeply hidden phenomena. Okay, you have to get the DVD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you missed, you missed that class. Remember, manifest phenomena are those that are known can be known with direct perception from the very beginning. Hidden phenomena cannot be known with direct perception from the beginning. Have to be known by inference, but then. Once known by inference and familiarized with, can be known directly, such as subtle impermanence, emptiness, and so forth. 
deeply hidden phenomena can't be, with ordinary, other than the Buddha's mind, can't be known with direct perception, can only be known by inference. Say, for instance, that uh, this particular action, the lady giving bread to the Buddha, that she would actually be born as a Pratika Buddha as a result of that particular karma that's deeply hidden, that's deeply hidden or also the, the qualities of a Buddha and so forth, deeply hidden phenomena. So like the wiring behind the walls that you can't, you can't perceive. You know. Did you say Buddha only knows that by inference? No, we can only know that by inference. Ordinary beings can only... We can know that certain things about karma. We can know that uh, giving will give rise to resources. And we can know that morality can give rise to high status, to being born in the upper realms. But we don't know, when we give, we can be assured, we can actually realize through uh, inference by the, uh, the power of the fact, which is one of the ones that we'll be talking about, that uh, giving will bring resources. That's not deeply hidden, that's a hidden phenomenon. But the particular giving, when we give some money, or we give something, we give food or something, we, don't, we can't tell, we can't infer from that what the particular consequence is. Oh, I know, 47,000 years from now, 47,000 eons, the result of this will be this. There's no way to infer that. Only by depending on the omniscient mind, a valid person, we can infer that by what's the third kind of inference that we're talking about here. Okay, that we're, we're, how's it, how's it phrasing here? There are three kinds. Through belief, the inference of belief. Yitshegi Chepak. So if you go through that, familiarize with that, and uh, through page 21, 22, and I think now we're getting down to some very interesting stuff. And you'll have to grok a lot. Okay, so let's, let's try to, let's try to dedicate this merit. Try to calm the mind by focusing inward toward the mental consciousness. And even if there's a continuity of images to your mind, to your senses, seeing through them, not giving them any mental energy so they can subside quickly, focusing just on that clarity that we've begun to get a mental image of, which is also a subtle, hidden phenomena not deeply hidden, but something that we can only have a mental image of first and then have a direct perception later. And recognizing due to the motivation at the beginning, due to the continuity of motivation over these weeks of study, studying the Mahayana teachings that are not just trivial information, but actually conducive to our path to enlightenment. We've created merit tonight to dedicate it in such a way that it will not be used up in one or some small number of occasions in the future but that it will, it will have a longevity until we attain enlightenment. Due to this merit, may I achieve all of the realizations of the path, good heart, compassion, wisdom, and quickly transforming my mind, overcoming my faults, developing my good qualities. May I become a Buddha, a Guru Buddha, that's in a position to lead perfectly all sentient beings to enlightenment.
try to seal that always with an apprehension of the emptiness of the three spheres. The merits being dedicated, the object being dedicated to, in this case, our enlightenment, our future enlightenment, and the act of dedication, those three spheres are all empty of existing truly and independently. But they still function. There is no self. <laughs>